Good evening. At the very beginning of our time together tonight, I want to acknowledge that Booth University College is located on Treaty One territory, the traditional home of several indigenous peoples and of the Métis Nation. The Earl Robinson Memorial Lectures on Christian Faith in the World were established by an endowment from the Canada and Bermuda Territory to honor the life of Colonel Earl Robinson, the first president of Booth University College. In the spring of 1981, Colonel Robinson, together with his wife, Colonel Benita Robinson, arrived in Winnipeg to lay the groundwork for the establishment of this institution. Colonel Robinson's skill, wisdom, and determination placed what was then known as Catherine Booth Bible College on a firm foundation and an upward trajectory. After 12 years leading the institution, Colonel Robinson moved to serve with distinction in several other appointments, including significant international Salvation Army assignments. Throughout his life, Colonel Earl Robinson devoted himself to the service of God and the Salvation Army. Knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge, and education in the Christian faith were constant priorities for Earl Robinson. So it's appropriate that this lecture series should be offered under his name and in his memory. Just a couple of notes before we actually begin the presentation tonight. First of all, during the presentation, you will be able to submit questions through the Q&A function on this webinar. And at the conclusion of the lecture, some of those questions will be answered. Secondly, tonight's webinar is being recorded and in due course will be made available on the Booth University College YouTube channel. Now to the presentation. When I was in grade nine, our English teacher led us through a reading of William Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. At a critical point in the play, one of Shakespeare's characters says, quote, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose, end of quote. That statement made an impression upon me at the time, and for some reason it stayed with me all these years. There's a sense in which I think the very idea that even the devil can cite scripture for the devil's own purposes has haunted me. It suggests that scripture is vulnerable to misinterpretation and intentionally false interpretations. So that rather than an instrument for good, the Bible can become an instrument of evil. So with that in mind, I'm left with the perplexing question, how can we distinguish between the faithful interpretation of scripture and the citation of the Bible to serve our own purposes or even to serve the purposes of the devil. As I look back over the past several decades and reflect upon my efforts to interpret scripture faithfully, I think it's accurate to say that I've been trying to find ways to read the Bible that would ensure that I, unlike the devil, am not simply citing scripture to serve my own purposes. And furthermore, in my teaching and writing, I've been attempting to steer others away from devilish contortions of the Bible. So the purpose of this presentation tonight is to draw together some of my own reflections on the interpretation of scripture that might be useful as a guide for salvationists and other Christians as we read and interpret the Bible as the sacred scriptures given to the church by God as the primary means of guidance on matters of Christian faith and practice. Certainly, I do not want to suggest that salvationists have a monopoly on the correct interpretation of Scripture. But as a salvationist, I'm left wondering whether our salvationist identity, as both Christians and Wesleyans, might help to guide us toward reading the Bible not simply as a library of ancient religious texts, but more importantly, as the sacred Scriptures of the Salvation Army and of the church universal. Is it possible then to identify some starting points or basic principles that might help us approach and interpret the Bible faithfully? This evening, I'm going to suggest eight affirmations 
that can guide our interpretation of the Bible. My first point of reference this evening is the wording of our first doctrine. This doctrinal statement suggests the first three affirmations that I want to articulate in this presentation. To remind us, our first statement of doctrine reads, we believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments were given by inspiration of God, and that they only constitute the divine rule of faith and practice. From this statement of doctrine, as I mentioned, three different principles of interpretation arise. And the first affirmation I want us to pay attention to is the affirmation that we believe there is one Bible. This first principle of interpretation for salvationists that emerges from our doctrine is simply that the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament together, comprise our Christian scriptures. As a result, we do not privilege one testament over the other. We reject any latent Marcionism that would relegate the Old Testament to the status of second-class scripture. We do not accept the false caricatures of the Old Testament as law and the New Testament as grace, suggesting an inferiority of the Old Testament, or indeed its supersession by the New Testament. In our interpretation of Scripture, we read the two Testaments together, hearing the witness of each to the one God who is revealed in Jesus Christ and who continues to be present among us through the Holy Spirit. Further, I would suggest that we reject any so-called canon within the canon that would value some writings more than others. Thus, for example, we don't give special status to Paul's letters with their teaching of justification by faith over against, for example, the Gospel of Matthew or the letter of James or even the Johannine literature. Rather than the easy road, of simply ignoring certain parts of Scripture that don't meet our personal standards, we take the hard road of maintaining the wholeness of the Christian canon. We don't succumb to the temptation to shorten the canon to a few favorite books, a few favorite writers, or even a few favorite texts. Now, I have to admit that the Two Testament canon presents challenges to the Church as it seeks to articulate the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As it turns out, these challenges are not new. Within the first centuries of the church, Christians sensed some unease with the Old Testament. However, one helpful recent approach to maintaining the close relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament has been the use of what is called a missional hermeneutic that interprets the two Testaments as united, primarily in their focus on the one unified mission of God to save the world. For advocates of this approach, from the beginning of the Old Testament and the first chapters of the book of Genesis to the very end of the Christian canon, with the vision of the creation of a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation 21, the entire Christian canon is unified by this one mission of God to rescue, to restore, and to redeem the world. In the unfolding of this mission, the story would be incomplete and perhaps even unintelligible without both Testaments. But I would also add that this emphasis on the mission of God in the world is highly congruent with salvationist emphasis on mission. So the first basic point that I want to make this morning, this evening, is that our first doctrine teaches us that we believe that there is one whole Bible in its entirety. The second point this evening that I want to make, and the second affirmation I want us to consider, is that we must seek to hear the full voice of Scripture. The goal of biblical interpretation should be to hear what I call the full voice of Scripture. For the past 200 years, historical, critical, biblical scholarship has been successful in drawing our attention to the many individual voices 
that speak in the Bible. We're able to hear these voices more clearly than ever before. We've learned from historical critical study that the Bible includes many voices that sometimes on first reading may appear to be in tension with one another or even to contradict one another. But rather than seeking to silence these disparate voices through neglect or through a deliberate decision, it seems to me that the preferred response should be to listen attentively to their distinctive individual contributions to the canon and also to listen to these texts within the context of the whole canon of scripture. If we do this, the apparent contradictions that are identified by biblical scholars often present alternative perspectives, each of which expresses truth in part, and none of which expresses truth in its entirety. And so we come closer to the truth, closer to hearing what God would teach us, when we're able to listen to all the voices of Scripture, not just those we prefer, and not just those that agree with our personal opinions and viewpoints. An analogy that I've found helpful is relevant here, and perhaps relevant for the Salvation Army. In a brass band, there is a range of individual instruments that play many different musical parts, all as a component of one single musical composition. Some of these instruments carry the melody much of the time. Others provide the harmony, and still others provide depth to the sound of the band. Now in rehearsals, it may be common for the bandmaster to have individual sections of the band rehearse their part without the rest of the band. So when the second trombones, for example, are asked to play their part on their own, it's often difficult to hear or even imagine what the main melody would be. When heard it on its own, it may be difficult to imagine the contribution that a relatively minor part plays within the overall composition. But in a performance, when the entire band begins to play a composition with the melody and the harmony and the various relatively minor parts that provide texture to the music, when the entire band plays in a performance, we hear the full voice of the band and the full voice of the composer. Few of us would wish to listen to a selection in which only the melodies play. It could seem rather tinny and lack depth of sound. And I dare say that even fewer of us would want to listen to a selection in which the only part we hear is that played by the second trombones, with all apologies to everyone who plays second trombone, or the second horns, or the second baritones. We would recognize that this too produces an impoverished experience, and that we're not in fact hearing the band selection in its fullness. In a similar way, not all parts of scripture play the same role within the biblical canon. Some books and passages carry the melody of the Bible much of the time, and others rarely even hint at it. Yet they contribute to the overall experience or teaching of the Bible. It's when the, scriptures, when the scriptures are taken together as a whole that we are able to hear their message most clearly. And this should be what we seek when we read and listen to the testimony of the Holy Spirit through the scriptures. In our interpretation of the Bible, we should seek to ensure that this full voice of scripture is taken into account. This effort to interpret biblical texts within the context of the full voice of scripture provides a measure of protection against the dangers of proof texting, or as Shakespeare would say it, it provides a measure of protection against allowing the devil to cite scripture for his own purposes. As we turn to the third affirmation that arises from our first doctrine, we suggest that we believe that scripture is the divine rule of Christian faith and practice. We need to attend carefully to the actual claim that our first doctrine makes about the scope 
of the authority of the Bible as sacred scripture. It's described as, quote, the divine rule of Christian faith and practice, end of quote. What this suggests is that the scriptures are authoritative, what this suggests is the scriptures are authoritative for the church on matters of faith and practice. As the frequently cited text in 2 Timothy chapter 3 asserts, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. The expansion of claims for the authority of the Bible beyond matters of Christian faith and practice, for example, to matters of history and science, while it may be well-intentioned, it is not consistent with our doctrine and is not consistent with our own Wesleyan heritage. In our study of scripture, we should focus on matters of Christian faith and practice. Wesley himself understood the purpose of the scriptures to be centered upon right doctrine and right living. Our first doctrine takes this approach to the scriptures. As salvationists, we study the Bible to learn what we believe and how we should live. Now this leads us to our fourth affirmation, which is that the Bible is inspired by God and yet written by human beings. To the first three principles of interpretation that arise from our doctrine, I want to add the following. Salvationist interpretation of the Bible should be shaped by the conviction that the human authors of the individual writings were guided and directed by God, and that nevertheless, they maintained, they remained fully embodied human beings. The scriptures, in other words, were inspired by God, and at the same time, were the product of human beings. Now, is there a way that we can understand this claim? I want to suggest that an analogy between the nature of the Bible as both the Word of God and simultaneously the Word of humans, an analogy using that affirmation and putting it alongside what we affirm about Jesus may be helpful here. As the Salvation Army's fourth doctrine states, quote, we believe that in the person of Jesus Christ, the divine and human natures are united so that he is truly and properly God and truly and properly man. End of quote. I want to use this statement to help us understand the nature of Scripture. So I would paraphrase this doctrine as follows. We believe that in the Scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the divine and human natures are united so that the scriptures are truly and properly divine, that is, inspired by God, and truly and properly human, that is, written by human beings. This suggests that in the Bible, the divine and human nat natures are united so closely that they cannot be divided without doing irreparable damage to the scriptures as a whole and to our ability to receive the Bible as sacred scripture. Amplifying the divine inspiration of the scriptures to such an extent that we compromise the full humanity of the Bible as the product of human authors endangers our reading of scripture. And similarly, Amplifying the full humanity of the Bible as the product of historically embedded humans to the point that we diminish its divine inspiration endangers our reception of the Bible as the scriptures of the church. It seems to me that for the proper interpretation of the Bible, it's imperative that we acknowledge, on the one hand, the fullness of the inspiration of the Bible by God, and on the other hand, 
the fullness of its origin as the product of human authors. These two assertions must be held together because we believe that in the scriptures, the word of God has been incarnated in the word of human beings. Now, if we were to accept this principle, it seems to me that two other principles of interpretation arise. First, the reading of the scriptures as fully human mandates that we use all of the tools of scholarship available to us to understand and interpret the biblical text as products of human authors. The divine word is incarnated in the world of human affairs, and therefore it is incumbent upon us to study the linguistic, historical, cultural, sociological, political, and economic context of the Bible. The historical critical method broadly defined with all of its strengths and its limitations is warranted by the human nature of the biblical text and it supports our reading of the Bible as the product of human authors. But on the other hand, at the same time, we also must recognize that this thorough and unrelenting historical critical interpretation does not in fact constitute the fullness of a Christian interpretation of the Bible as scripture, because it cannot, by its very nature, take into account the divine inspiration of the Bible. So while it's imperative that as that we employ the full range of methods for uncovering the full humanity of the biblical texts, it is also imperative that we receive the text as the inspired word of God reading the Bible prayerfully, inviting the Holy Spirit to guide the process, reading the scriptures through the tradition of its Christian interpreters, and using the methods of theological interpretation generally, all contribute to the interpretation of the Bible as fully divine. Ultimately, as Christian interpreters, we must submit ourselves to the witness of these texts, to the one who inspired them and to who continues to inspire them. Neglecting or compromising either the divine inspiration of scripture or its origin as the product of human authors leads to the truncation and distortion of the witness of the Bible as sacred scripture. An additional implication of the confession that the scriptures are divine is that they are always correcting us. That is, no one's individual interpretation is beyond correction by the Holy Spirit through the scriptures. Humility before the word of God is a key attribute of any interpreter of the Bible. Such humility must include openness to correction. And finally, the inspiration of the scriptures by God is not only an event in the past, as though the divine inspiration of the Bible took place only at the time of its writing. Rather, we affirm that the Holy Spirit continues to inspire the scriptures. And as we seek the guidance of the Spirit, our reading of scripture is brought to life, and the Holy Spirit speaks once again to us. The fifth affirmation that I want to suggest to us tonight for consideration is that we must learn to read the scriptures in what John Wesley called in conference. One of the key insights of John Wesley regarding the interpretation of the Bible was that such interpretation is best undertaken in conference. That is, in the company of and in dialogue with other Christians. Wesley believed fervently that in open and thorough dialogue with others in an intentional Christian community, the Holy Spirit has great scope to guide our interpretation in the right direction and to correct aberrant interpretations. Solitary interpretation of the Bible often leads to idiosyncratic results. Now, as salvationists, we are not skilled at reading and interpreting scripture in conference, that is, with other salvationists 
or with other Christians. We don't often come together with a focus on the dynamic interactions around scripture that would cultivate common interpretations and identity. This represents a significant loss for the army for at least two reasons. First, our failure to interpret scripture in conference prevents the cultivation of a broadly based, scripturally grounded identity, mission, and perspective. And second, and perhaps even more importantly, in a time when biblical literacy is in rapid decline, our, our failure to read the scriptures in conference deprives us of an invaluable opportunity to ground salvationists in scripture through reading it together. The result is that often, not only do salvationists not understand what we believe, but we also don't know why we even believe it in the first place. The sixth affirmation that I want to suggest for consideration this evening is that we believe that, the, that salvation is the focus of Scripture. John Wesley maintained a single-minded focus in his use and interpretation of the Scriptures. For Wesley, the hermeneutical key to the Bible was the way of salvation. That is, the scriptures describe the human condition of being under the power and guilt of sin. But they go on to describe the effort of God to provide the means through which humans might be saved from our sinful condition. And then the scriptures go on to convey the invitation to Christian holiness, which is the vocation of all people. In its broadest strokes, Wesley's interpretation of Scripture was guided by this biblical account of God's unrelenting determination to save humanity and the world. Our Wesleyan heritage teaches us that the salvation to which God invites us is a full salvation that includes not only the forgiveness of our sins, but also the reformation of our character, the transformation of our dispositions, to conform to the image and likeness of Christ. For Wesley, this spans the full horizon of salvation, including prevenient grace, justification, new birth, Christian perfection, and final salvation. And according to Wesley, this scripture way of salvation is the interpretive key to the reading of the Bible. Now, the seventh affirmation that I want to share with you this evening is one that arises particularly out of our salvationist heritage. For we believe the Bible proclaims salvation for both worlds. Salvationist interpretation of the scriptures will draw upon the insight of William Booth that God calls us to a vocation of bringing, quote, salvation for both worlds, end of quote. What this means is that we interpret salvation to embrace not only the full salvation of individuals, but also the salvation of this world. Our interpretation of Scripture must take seriously the divine call to holiness, yes, as well as the divine call to work for the transformation of the earthly conditions in which humans live so that they resemble more closely the biblical vision of the faithful human community that's characterized by shalom or human flourishing. Now, our own organizational history has taught us that neither of these emphases can be neglected without compromising our identity and without truncating our mission. And neither focus, either on individual salvation or the salvation of the world, Neither focus can be neglected in our interpretation of the Bible without losing the vital dynamic of the Word of God entrusted to the church. Too often, the church has been divided into two camps, one made up of those who read the scriptures through a lens which sees only the concerns of a narrow piety that interprets holiness in individualistic terms, 
and on the other hand, a second perspective, comprised of those who read scripture attuned predominantly to the social implications of the gospel. In our weakest moments and manifestations, as salvationists, we have separated into these two camps. Either holiness is viewed as individual salvation and has been interpreted as the real mission of the army, or our social ministries have been viewed as the primary mission God has given us. When we turn to the Bible, one can marshal evidence to support either of these perspectives, and yet neither, in fact, provides the biblical perspective in its entirety. You see, the brilliance of William Booth's call to salvation for both worlds is that it captures more faithfully the full voice of Scripture than is possible when we attend primarily only to one voice or the other. So as a result of this orientation of the army and its mission, salvationist interpretation of the scriptures should be undertaken within the framework of this enlarged understanding of salvation. We will read the Bible against the backdrop of the scriptural narrative of the determination and efforts of God to bring about the salvation of all humanity and to restore the heavens and the earth to their creational purpose. We will understand that as the Christian scriptures, the Bible speaks of this coherent divine purpose. Alongside this, salvationist interpretation of the Bible also will be alert to the human distortion of social relationships and will be alert to God's call and endeavors to restore creation and human relationships. When reading the Bible, we will be attentive to the social, the political, the economic and interpersonal implications of God's love for the world. Salvationists will be attentive to issues of justice, social arrangements and conditions that facilitate the growth of shalom. Salvationists will be attentive to matters of forgiveness, personal transformation, and holiness. Our reading of scripture will avoid both a one-sided emphasis on an otherworldly, individualistic salvation and an equally one-sided focus on the social conditions of this world. We will approach the scriptures with an understanding that the focus of the Bible is not just on the salvation of individuals or not just on the salvation of the world, but on salvation for both worlds. This is important not only because it's grounded in our salvationist heritage, but more importantly, because the, in, the indivisible union of the religious, the spiritual, and the social dimensions of Christian faith is foundational to the biblical narrative itself. Thus we find that God acted to deliver the Hebrew slaves from the oppressive social and economic policies of Pharaoh, as well as to free them to serve the Lord their God. We acknowledge that the covenant between God and Israel is instituted in the Sinai narratives of the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, that this covenant structures the Ten Commandments in such a way that the relationship between God and Israel, which is the focus of the first commandments, is joined together with concerns about the quality of Israel's life together as a community in the commandments that follow. And we find further that prophets such as Amos argued that there is a fundamental relationship between the worship of the Lord and the quality of Israel's life as a community. Without justice and righteousness, the worship of Israel became abhorrent to God. For Israel, theology and social ethics are joined together. And when they're divorced, as they were in the time of the 8th century prophets, Israel's entire vocation as the covenant people of the Lord was in jeopardy. And turning to the New Testament, as salvationists, we attend to Matthew's focus on the importance of holy living within the community of the church, such as we find in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. 
but we also pay careful attention to Luke's focus on Jesus' mission to those who are marginalized, which is emphasized especially in Jesus' sermon at Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. The Salvationist interpretation of Scripture through the lens of salvation for both worlds acknowledges this indissoluble union within the full canon of Scripture, the union between the salvation of individuals to a vocation of holiness and the salvation of the world of this world with all of its wounds and injuries. And then finally, we acknowledge that the culmination of the entire biblical canon is the creation of a new heaven and a new earth as revealed in Revelation 21. As salvationists, we receive this vision of John of a new heaven and a new earth as a call to live leaning forward toward the horizon of the new creation and the kingdom of God. This leads finally to the eighth affirmation that I want to suggest this evening for your consideration. And that is that we believe that love for God and love for our neighbor is our guide for interpretation. This final guide for interpretation of scripture by salvationists is grounded in the great commandment of Jesus that's summarized as all-encompassing love for God and thoroughgoing love for our neighbor. This commandment of Jesus in Matthew 22 echoes commandments from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. As a summary of Christian faith and action, this twofold command to love God and to love our neighbor has had a long history in Christianity, including in the teachings of John Wesley. As such, I think it can provide us with a measuring rod for our interpretation of the Bible. As a guide for Christian faith and practice, the purpose of Scripture is to stir Christians toward greater love for God and greater love for our neighbors. And if this is true, then our interpretation and application of Scripture in all of its parts should cultivate in us greater love for God and greater love for our neighbor. I think that this can function as a standard to evaluate the extent to which our interpretation of any passage of Scripture conforms to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For if any particular interpretation of Scripture does not nurture greater love for God and greater love for our neighbor, and especially if upon reflection we find that it might rather stir up hostility toward God or hostility toward our neighbor, then we must step back to reconsider whether we are, in fact, hearing the Word of God or hearing words reflecting our own prejudice. That seems to me to be a vital measuring rod that we can use to evaluate our interpretation of Scripture. These eight affirmations and guidelines for the interpretation of Scripture, I think, provide us with some useful tools to help us and to protect us from aberrant readings of the Bible. Reading the Bible as sacred scripture is one of our primary mandates as Christians and as salvationists, if we in fact believe that it is the only divine rule of Christian faith and practice. Without this, we cut ourselves off from the primary means by which the Holy Spirit instructs, guides, and directs us. But if Shakespeare was correct, the devil also reads the Bible and knows it well. In fact, I might even suggest that the devil knows the Bible far better than most salvationists. Our challenge is to work together 
to identify those practices and disciplines that will help us to attend more carefully and more fully to the scriptures as the Holy Spirit continues to inspire them. We're now going to take a brief pause to view a message from Booth University College, and when we return, I'll respond to some of the questions that viewers have submitted during this presentation. Not all of us set out to change the world, but for those of us who do, knowing where to begin can be hard, because the world, though beautiful, is broken in so many ways. Some ways that make it seem like one person can't possibly make a difference, and other ways that are just easier to ignore. But we don't believe in an easy world. We believe in a better world. At Booth University College, change starts on the front lines, where we can make the biggest difference, and where others might be afraid to go. We fight for justice. We bridge divides and we share ideas. Because as an institution grounded in the Christian faith, we know a better world is possible. And it's within our ability to make it happen. Whether that world is halfway across the globe or right around the corner. We believe in making a difference in more than just our own lives. That the skills to change the world can be taught, fostered, inspired, and strengthened. And that it doesn't take an army to make an impact. But it helps. Whoever you are, whatever you believe, wherever you're going, a better world begins here. Booth University College. Education for a better world. So I steer my way away. I, I say that jokingly, but there's a sense in which I... I also think it's true. Um, I wouldn't advise someone to begin with some of the Old Testament books if they're really wanting to study the Bible um, and, and advance their study of the Bible initially. Uh, I would steer them away from some of the books. I wouldn't read Habakkuk necessarily as the first thing in the Bible. I wouldn't read Nahum uh, as my first choice in the Old Testament, but it's Nahum's like the second trombone part in a band. Uh, apologies once again to the second trombonist. I'm going to get lots of responses to that, I suspect, in the chat. Um, but I think there's a time and a place for each of the books of the Bible, and reading the Old Testament does present unique challenges. So my encouragement is take up the challenge. Sometimes you need a good guide to help you through that, but also recognize that, that in the Old Testament we find uh, some very, very rich material, and it's, it's important to recognize the diversity of voices that we hear in the Old Testament. One of the things I'd say about reading the Bible that's very important is that the Bible reasons, the scriptures reason very differently. We want to logically work out a solution to a problem, whereas the way in which the Bible often works is it prevents, presents rather alternative perspectives. Um, so are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? Well, actually, if you read even the New Testament, you find texts that will say both things, or one will say this and one will say that. Often the truth is found in holding both assertions together. So that the more we read of the entire canon of Scripture, the more perspectives we're able to bring together, and I think the closer we come to the truth. So I think I've gone way off the mark on that question, but that's fairly typical. Um, here's another one. How would you suggest that salvationists read and interpret scripture in conference? What are practical ways we could do this? Well, that's a very good question. I think we live in a time, that, a unique moment in time, uh, in terms of developing ways to read scripture in conference. And that is precisely in the way that we're doing this tonight. Uh, I think We've got the technology, and one of the side effects of this uh, global pandemic is it's forcing us to do things online. We can bring community together and read in conference together in many different way ways. We can do it physically by bringing people together 
simply to talk through biblical texts and to learn together from the biblical text and to focus on the interpretation of the text, but we can also do it virtually. And um, I think that's one of the great revelations that the last seven months have taught us, that this is possible. We're doing it with worship now of necessity, but I think we could also do this. And I know there's some, even in our own territory, who are doing Bible study virtually and inviting others to join them. That's a great innovation. And I think that they're intentionally creating opportunities for that um, would be a great boon to reading the scriptures in conference. Um, and we, we should do that more and more. Uh, I think that's worth thinking about and, and certainly would encourage us to explore various ideas. I also think in some of our larger Salvationist gatherings, a stronger emphasis on reading scripture together and interpreting scripture together uh, in these larger events would be welcome and would be a great benefit to us organizationally. Another question, are there Salvationists living today who I would cite as true biblical scholars? Um, that's a great question. Um, let me say that I don't think uh, being a biblical scholar is a matter of academic credentials. I really am not convinced of that. Academic credentials, studying the Bible uh, in an academic setting, in a seminary or college or university, uh, is one step, but that doesn't make you a, a biblical scholar in, in the sense that I think is intended here. Um, I think that's very much, um, it, it's a larger question. In terms of identifying some, I think there are some Salvationists that I think read very, the Bible very attentively and very well and interpret it very well. I'm hesitant to name people because I think I'd leave people leave someone out, but yes, I do think there are some um, who are very good at this, very skilled at it, and we need to work as a Salvation Army, we need to work at cultivating that uh, because we do need uh, more technically biblical scholars, um, and, and I think we suffer from a lack of them. Um, we are the poorer because we don't encourage this. Another question, and I'm reading some of these for the first time, so um, here's one. I'll see where it goes. It seems some would interpret your comment as part of the third proposition, that the Bible should not be seen as authoritative on other matters, such as history. Uh, some would hear that as saying that the Bible is incorrect in those matters. So the question is, what would you say its lack of authority in those matters, or would you say that its lack of authority in matters such as history disqualifies it from being a reliable source in the study of history or other subjects? I think probably I'd say other subjects such as science. I am always hesitant to suggest that the Bible has inaccuracies, but I will say that I don't think the primary function or purpose of the Bible is to provide historical information or scientific information. The primary purpose, we affirm, of the Bible is to guide us in matters of Christian faith and practice. It may well be that the Bible contains information that can be verified by historians according to the methodologies of historiography uh, and contemporary historiography. That may well be true in some instances, but that is not its primary purpose. And one of the concerns I have is that if we read the Bible with a primary focus on historical matters, then we have to recognize that we're entering into the ballpark of historians and we have to play by their rules. Or if we want to extract from the Bible scientific information, we're playing in the field of scientists and we've got to play by their rules. It seems to me that often those kinds of scientific and historical inquiries can become distractions from what we really believe scripture's about. And that is, it's to be a guide for how we live, for what we believe, and how we live out our faith. And 
I'm concerned that sometimes we can focus on relatively minor points when it comes to Christian faith and practice with our focus on history or science, and we miss the larger claims that Scripture makes on our lives. So I would put the emphasis elsewhere, not on inac so-called inaccuracies in the Bible, but rather on focusing on its proper function and purpose in the life of Christians and the life of the Christian community at large. Uh, the next question is, our preaching should reflect both natures of Jesus as fully human and, and, uh, and fully divine, uh, or potentially, do, hmm. um, I'm just trying to read this. What are the ramifications of Jesus being fully human and fully divine upon sharing a personal testimony? Or is it only applicable to the nature of the Bible as written by humans and inspired by God? So I think this question is really about our fourth doctrine. And why is it important to affirm that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human? To answer that question, I'm going to go back to the early history of the church and the history of that doctrine. That doctrine really reflects uh, a creed that was developed in the fifth century uh, of the church, the articulation of the full divinity and the full humanity of Jesus brought together in the one um, one person. Um, what was argued in the early church, which I think is very important, is that the full humanity of Jesus is critical because the part, if there are any parts of our human nature that Jesus didn't take unto himself, those he cannot save. So if Jesus did not share something of our human nature, then that's beyond the realm of the salvation he can offer. On the other hand, if Jesus is not fully divine, he simply isn't able to save us. It takes, it takes the divine Christ, it takes God to save us. So the full humanity of Jesus is necessary to, to save and deliver our full humanity, and the divinity of Jesus is essential for salvation itself, because fundamentally human beings cannot save themselves. So I think when we, when we look at that, we recognize that that fourth doctrine is critically important. I think that's just about the time that we've got tonight. I want to finish by thanking you for taking the time this evening. This is the first in a series of six Robinson Lectures, Earl Robinson Memorial Lectures, that we'll be offering over the next six or seven months. The next one, which I would encourage you to register for, uh, is a presentation by Dr. Roger Green, uh, a well-known biographer of both William Booth and Catherine Booth. Uh, he is now working on, with Major Peter Farthing, a biography of Bramwell Booth, and he's been working on this for some time now, and Roger's going to join us and share with us some of his reflections on the writing of a biography of Bramble Booth. That will take place on Tuesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Central Time, and I would invite you to join us at that time. 